achieved. Since their descriptions of non-Euclidean geometry are so similar, it's convenient to describe their work together. And because their geometry turns out to be somewhat different from that of Euclid's, we have to suspend many of our conceptions of the world and prepare to enter a new universe. Perhaps the first surprise is that Lobachevsky and Janosz Boyai both began by describing a three-dimensional geometry. In this three-dimensional world, they assumed that a line and a point defined a plane, and that in such a plane, there are always infinitely many lines through the point that do not meet the given line. They found that on this assumption, there are two really interesting lines through the point. There is one in each direction that is asymptotic to the initial line, that is, gets closer and closer to it, but never meets it. These lines we call the asymptotic parallels to the initial line. So that all these lines eventually meet the baseline, and all these lines eventually diverge from it in both directions. But it's these, the asymptotic parallels, that we'll be particularly interested in they wanted to work out the trigonometry associated with this new geometry. For example, they asked, given this distance, what is this angle, known as the angle of parallelism? And they wanted the answer as a function of the distance, A. And here's something relatively new, the use of functions to do geometry. But first, to orient ourselves, we'll turn this picture round. The initial line now becomes a perpendicular, standing on this plane. And here's an asymptotic parallel to the line. Now, in this novel geometry, they picked another point, so they got a right-angled non-Euclidean triangle with its right angle here. And through this point, they drew the asymptotic parallel to the original perpendicular. Over at this vertex, they added a tiny little hemisphere. And between these three lines on the surface of the sphere, they drew a tiny spherical triangle. Now for the wonderful idea. Remember the spherical geometry I showed you earlier? It doesn't depend on Euclid's postulates, or indeed on any assumption we make about parallel lines. So any trigonometric formulae describing the spherical triangle are true, even in this peculiar non-Euclidean world. Now, it turns out that the shape of one of these triangles determines the shape of the other. So if we know all about the shape of the spherical triangle, it should be possible to determine the shape of the non-Euclidean triangle. So Boyai and Lobachevsky could assume the spherical trigonometrical formulae were true, and from them deduce what formulae would describe the triangle in the non-Euclidean plane. They found they were able to deduce all they wanted about the new geometry. For example, by treating the original figure as being one of a triangle with a vertex at infinity, their formulae tell you what this angle is as a function of this distance. And that's just what was required, for that gave them the angle of parallelism. There's a wonderful extra to be got out of this. In proving their results, they made use of this bowl-shaped surface, which meets every possible asymptotic parallel to the original perpendicular at right angles. Here and here. It turns out, oddly enough, that this triangle has an angle sum of 180 degrees exactly. And indeed, any triangle we draw on this surface has an angle sum of exactly 180 degrees. So within the strange three-dimensional non-Euclidean space of Boyai and Lobachevsky, there is also an accurate picture of two-dimensional Euclidean geometry represented on this bowl. It would seem then that Boyai and Lobachevsky had finally resolved the problem of the status of geometry by exhibiting what Lobachevsky called an imaginary geometry different from Euclid's. Surely they had shown that Euclidean geometry was not, after all, necessarily true. But by and large, the response to Lobachevsky and Boyai's work was poor. And in a sense, we can see why. After all, 
they had both proceeded from an initial assumption about parallels. Strictly speaking, their work doesn't show that that assumption is logically possible. What was required was a complete rethink, something that could embrace both the old way of doing geometry and the new ideas. The man who was to provide this was a student of Gauss, the shy but gifted Bernard Riemann. Riemann's arguments were to revolutionise the way in which geometry was perceived. He didn't start with the belief that we all know what Euclidean geometry is, or even with the view that we know what straight lines and angles are. Riemann argued forcefully that you could do geometry on any surface, such as this pear-shaped surface. He started instead with the idea that we know how to measure length. That's something he said you can do in any geometry. If we have a curve on the surface, then we use the calculus to measure its length. Riemann was also able to define what a straight line is in terms of length. The straight line between two points is just the curve of shortest length on the surface between the points. What probably most excited Gauss, who was very impressed by Riemann's ideas, was that this new idea of what geometry is put all geometries on a par. Euclidean geometry is just now one of many geometries, the geometry of a flat surface. And what precisely is a flat surface? To see that a surface is flat, we can just step off it and look. But if we want to do geometry in Riemann's sense, we have to do it using properties that lie solely within the surface. Well, it was Gauss himself who had shown how to define what's called the curvature of a surface in such a way that it can be determined from properties within the surface alone. When we find, as we do, that for any triangle we can draw on this surface, the angles add up to 180 degrees, that amounts to showing, in Gauss's language, that the surface has zero curvature. In other words, it's flat. In the same way, if we find ourselves on a surface in which the angles of every triangle add up to more than 180 degrees, then we're on a surface which has positive curvature, such as this sphere. And here's a triangle on a surface we wish to understand. It's easy enough to construct a bit of such a surface, and we say it has negative curvature because it curves towards us in one direction, but away from us in the other. But what's worrying about this surface is that when you try to extend it, it might not be able to grow beyond a certain point. That would be dreadful for any surface that was trying to be a model of even two-dimensional space, because nobody believed that space came to an end. The man who was able to overcome this dilemma was an Italian, Eugenio Beltrami. Beltrami's solution was ingenious. He observed that an atlas is as good a description of a sphere as any. If you know how the scale varies from point to point, you can work out from the atlas how far apart these points are on the sphere. So an atlas is a perfectly good description of a surface of constant positive curvature. It has some disagreeable features, for example, on this one, equal distances on the sphere appear to stretch more and more as you move outwards. Beltrami's idea was to construct an atlas for a surface of constant negative curvature. If he could construct such an atlas, then he could hope to show that there was such a surface and that there was no problem about it stopping at a boundary. Beltrami did indeed succeed in constructing such a map, but it's the version constructed by Henri Poincaré that I'd like to show you. Like the maps in the usual atlas of a globe, distances are distorted. In this case, the whole of two-dimensional non-Euclidean space is depicted inside this disk. As I move outwards, distances appear to shrink, but that's a distortion of the map-making process. We non-Euclideans don't actually shrink, nor do we ever run up against an edge. Now, looking from above, we can see how, on this map, non-Euclidean straight lines appear as arcs of circles perpendicular to the boundary circle or as diameters. But angles appear actual size. So you can see that in this triangle, the angle sum really is less than 180 degrees, or two right angles. And here, you can see that in non-Euclidean geometry, there really are two asymptotic parallels to this line through this point. Of course, the lines meet at the boundary, but that's a non-Euclidean analogue of the way we talk of Euclidean parallel lines meeting at infinity. <laughs>
So, maps like this disk indeed show that a surface of constant negative curvature exists. For the first time, mathematicians could be certain that an alternative geometry was possible. So now, not only could one doubt the truth of Euclidean geometry, one had to doubt it. But what of three-dimensional space? Could a three-dimensional non-Euclidean universe be depicted? Well, here is such a model. The whole of the non-Euclidean universe is inside this ball. Here in this slice is our two-dimensional representation with the triangle that we saw earlier in the Lobachevsky model. You can see the asymptotic parallels, which now meet the original line at the top. The asymptotic parallels appear curved because of the way the map has been made. Again, this apparent point of contact is actually infinitely far away in our non-Euclidean space, as are all the points of this enclosing sphere. And this sphere, inside the large one, is the surface which is perpendicular to all the possible asymptotic parallels to that first line. And on this surface, the angle sum of any triangle is 180 degrees. So this three-dimensional atlas confirms that a three-dimensional non-Euclidean space is possible. It now does become a matter for the experimenter to determine which geometry is the true one. Finally, going back to this model, there are two equivalent ways of thinking of this configuration. Either you can see it from outside as a map of the three-dimensional non-Euclidean space discovered by Boyai and Lobachevsky, or you can see it from inside as a non-Euclidean three-dimensional space in which we have an accurate picture of another geometry, perhaps unfamiliar to us, but logically possible, the remarkable world of two-dimensional Euclidean geometry.